Now let's discuss risk premium, which will help you figure out how you should adjust away from chip EV strategies when there are payout implications and you need to be way more concerned with dollar EV. When you face a bet for all or most of your chips when there are payout implications, you need more than the normal required amount of equity base to call based on your pot odds, and sometimes a whole lot more because of the payout implications. And this is because if you call and lose, you are out or nearly out. And if you win, you don't double your equity. So in general, you are going to want to play cautiously when you are potentially at risk in a marginal chip EV spot. And you want to look to play pots where you can put your opponents at risk. Here we have a chart to help you see, like if this is our normal amount of equity, this may be the extra equity we need based on our risk premium. You need to consider risk premium both when you are betting and when you are calling a bet. And you're going to have a different risk premium against each other player at the table, which makes this kind of complicated and difficult to implement, but it is something you need to strive to do. In general, if your pr risk premium is much less than your opponent's, you get to apply a lot more pressure. This is going to be when you have a big stack and they have a short stack. When you cannot bust and they can bust, you get to be quite aggressive. When you can bust and they cannot, that's when you have to be way more cautious. It is difficult to know exactly how much the risk premium is because all situations are different, but this risk premium matrix will provide some rough guidelines for playing at the final table when you're facing an all-in or mostly all-in bet. This is essentially how much more equity you need when you are calling a substantial bet. So if you have a, if you have a big stack and you're against another big stack, you need roughly 18 to 35% more equity to justify calling, depending on the stack distribution of the other players. If somebody else has one big blind, you're going to need like 35% more, which is a lot. If there are no obvious short stacks, then you may need something like 18% more equity compared to chip EV to make a profitable dollar EV call. If you're a big stack against the middle stack, you need 6 to 8% equity more. And if you're a big stack against the short stack, you need almost no equity more, depending on how short the short stack is. If you're a medium stack, as you can see, you need 13 to 20% more equity against the big stack, against the medium stack, 10 to 22, or 10 to 20% more, and against the short stack, 5 to 7. And then if you're a short stack, you need roughly the same amount against all of the players involved, because when you're the short stack, usually you're going to be the one to go broke next, and you don't really care who you're going to get in against, because anyone can bust you. As a few general tips, you're going to want to play more cautiously in flat payout structures. And you're going to want to play more aggressively in top-heavy payout structures. For example, if it's winner-take-all, there is no payout jump. You don't care about laddering up because second and third and fourth all pays zero, right? Um, whereas if the payout structure is very flat, you are highly incentivized to just hang around and go from fourth to second or whatnot, if at all possible. That's something a lot of people don't necessarily understand. They sometimes get it backwards. They think a flat payout structure needs they, means they need to play crazy, but absolutely not. Let's take a look at an example with risk premium. On the bubble, with no obviously tiny stacks, everyone folds to the big stack with 40 big blinds and the small blind. You have 10 big blinds in the big blind. Here we are. Which hands should you go all in with? And which hands should you call with? Take a second, think about it. Well, in this scenario, on the bubble, he should go all in with all hands, 100% of hands, because you have to call much tighter than if there were no payout implications. And this is a spot where we're on the bubble, so this is where a relatively big payout jump is. If you just fold for a little bit, you're probably gonna end up getting a payout boost. So which hand should you call with? Well, there's not an easy answer. It depends. Depends on a few things. If there are a few short stacks who are very active, meaning they're in there blasting pretty hard, you are gonna need more than short stack against big stack, nine to 15% more equity compared to chip EV because one of them is very likely to go broke and you're going to collect that nice payout jump. If you're the only short stack though, you may need less than 9% because you're the person who is most likely to go broke next. Let's just presume in this scenario, you need an additional 12% due to the bubble. Hypothetically, it could be more, it could be less depending on the spot. So, we're going to go back to the same concept we used before of when you're calling it all in, except for we're going to need more equity to account for the payout implications. Here we're calling 9 to win a total of 21, so we need to realize 42.8% with no payout implications. With payout implications, though, we add 12 to that, 
We need 54.8 to justify calling. And let's say you want to profit. You don't want to just break even. So let's say we need to have 56% equity. Which hands have 50%, 56% equity against a 100% range? Well, it is these hands right here. Pretty tight range in general. I would say if this is the actual bubble of a tournament and there are other short stacks, maybe this number is not 12. Maybe maybe the risk premium is more like 18, in which case a lot of these hands are become easy folds. But this is roughly what you want to call with in this situation. And this is how I can go about figuring out spots like this. And I know this is gonna be very difficult to do at the table, but you can study scenarios like this away from the table and go through the content at pokercoaching.com. And hopefully a lot of this will become closer and closer to second nature for you so that you can naturally know roughly how much tighter you should be calling in spots like this. Recognize that risk premium also matters in non-substantial pots, even when all of your chips are not at risk. Here we have a chart for roughly how much of your stack you're risking and how much more of a risk premium you need to account for that. Um, essentially, as you're risking more and more of your stack for a pre-flop raise or a post-flop bet, you're going to need more equity in general compared to chip EV. So even when you're calling an initial raise pre-flop, you need to be a little bit tighter. I'm going to show you a chart in just a second for when you're in the big blind facing a raise. When you're facing a flop continuation bet, you need to be a little bit tighter, right? So this is going to result in you defending tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter across all betting rounds because you don't want to be putting your chips in in a roughly break-even spot. And if you look at a game theory optimal chart for chip EV, a lot of the hands that are barely playable profit almost nothing. So let's take a look at a final table. Here are the stacks. Hijack has 60, cutoff has 30, button has 15, small blind has 45, big blind has 30. Let's say the cutoff raises to 2.3 big blinds. Which hand should we defend in the big blind? Well, with no payout implications at all, the hands in dark red are all in, hands in light red are re-raise, hands in green are call, hands in blue are folds, okay? But with payout implications, take a look at all of these offsuit hands that have to fold now. Pretty much all of them <laughs> that don't have two cards, eight or higher, or nine or higher, two cards that don't have nine or higher are just open folding to the initial raise. Notice a lot of suited hands fold too. Something else you'll notice is you re-raise small way less often. Really, only aces, kings, ace, king suited, ace, jack suited, and a few bluffs with like ace, four offsuit, ace, six offsuit, ace, seven offsuit. And you're doing more all ins because you do not want to re raise small, get called, go to the flop, have some break even spot, and be unhappy about it for all of your chips. So, this is a spot where 30 big blinds deep, we are still shoving 16% of the time, but we're folding to the initial raise way more often. So, with no payout implications, we fold 15%. With payout implications in this exact scenario, we're folding 42.6%, which is quite a lot. So a big difference in strategy purely because of risk premium. You may say, why not just play maniacally if all of your opponents have to fold a little bit too often? Well, it's because when your overly aggressive plays fail, everyone else at the table profits a lot. And that is very, very bad for you. While playing maniacally will result in you winning the tournament more often each maniacal play costs you some amount of dollar EV in the long run. And when you make these plays that result in you giving away dollar EV over and over and over, that money is going to your opponents. And some of the biggest winners in poker tournaments at the highest stakes don't actually win the tournament the most. They take a whole lot of seconds and thirds because they get to the final table with a seventh place chip stack out of nine. They sit there, they hang out, they ladder up, and they take third place or they take second place. And... That's fine and good for them. Actually, just the other day, I played a 80-person tournament in Las Vegas in the PokerGo studio. I got to the final table with almost last in chips. I sat there. I won a hand. I ended up taking second place. I got heads up with one-sixth of the chips in play. Immediately lost ace-king against jack four or something, and then I was out. But that was a scenario where just by sitting there and being kind of tight, I moved up the payouts all the way up from seventh up to second. And even though I didn't get a trophy for it, I got a lot more money than I would have if I was only playing for the win. Recognize though, that everyone is definitely not aware of ICM and payout implications and risk premium. Some players have not studied ICM well or at all. Other players really do only care about the trophy or the bracelet. They want to get a victory. That said, other players blind out because they really want to move up the payouts. One time I was playing at a final table where they interviewed us the day before the final table and I heard my opponent say he really wanted to take fourth place so he could pay off his house. Well, that player played super duper tight until he got fourth place. And as soon as he got fourth place, he started going nuts. And 
That was good for me because I, I ran over his blinds and his initial raises early. And then as soon as he got his house paid off, I raised ace 10. He shoved it all in. I easily called it off. Mike Sexton, the commentator said, I can't believe Jonathan Little just called here. This guy's been playing so tight, but he had Jack eight suited and he had already locked up his house and I knew it. So you always want to be aware of what people are thinking about when it comes to the payout implications and recognize that your opponent's strategy is vitally, vitally important. In general, you want to avoid spots that are anywhere near break even late in the tournament. And if you, at least chip EV break late in the tournament. And if you do that, you're going to find that you consistently ladder up more than your opponents and that's gonna result in you winning a whole lot more money from tournaments in the long run. Have you ever studied GTO poker strategies and thought it actually made you worse at poker? Well, it probably did. And that's why we have created Peak GTO, the easiest place to learn GTO poker strategies where you'll be learning directly from top pros so that you can improve your skills, bump up your poker ELO rating, and actually get really good at poker. Get started for free right now. Now let's discuss managing your poker finances. To win at poker, you really only have to do three things. You have to find a game you can beat, you have to play it a lot, and you have to keep a proper bankroll. To find a game you can beat, either find really bad players to play against or study a lot and get way better than them. To play it a lot, find a game that actually runs somewhat consistently so you can put your butt in the chair and play hands. If you don't play, you're not going to extract value. And finally, keep a proper bankroll because poker has inevitable swings. And if you play on a short bankroll, even if you are better than your opponents, even if you play the game a lot, you may get wiped out and then lose the potential to put your butt in the chair and play it a lot, which will result in you not winning. So we're gonna go through some bankroll management tips and concepts. Recognize your bankroll is not an ATM. It is not a bank account where you can just go get money out and spend it on a new pair of shoes or a new CD or a new shirt or a trip. Withdrawing funds slows your progression substantially because taking money out of your bankroll for anything makes you have to play smaller buy-in events or smaller buy-in cash games, and that's going to result in you making a lower hourly rate. Your ideal bankroll is determined by a few things, mainly your edge in the game, the variance of the game and your strategy, and your tolerance for risk of ruin. If you're happier moving down in stakes or totally going broke, you don't need to keep nearly as a big of a bankroll compared to if you literally never want to go broke. That said, if you are a losing player, if you do not have an edge in the game you're playing with, if you forgot step number one and you did not find a game you can beat, you will lose in the long run. There's no weird bankroll martingale system or when you lose, move down or double up. Right? None of that stuff is going to result in you winning at poker. If you're a losing player, you will lose in the long run. Here are cash game bank roll requirements for one to no limit hold'em. It is based on your win rate. This presumes you're playing a normal amount of variance and a, you wanna have a relatively small risk of ruin. If you're winning, three big blinds per 100 hands, which is a smallish win rate online. You need about 10,000 big blinds or $20,000 to play one to no limit hold'em with a relatively low risk of ruin. If you're a pretty good online player winning seven big blinds per 100 hands, you need about 6,000 big blinds or $12,000. That may sound like a lot, but this is roughly what you're gonna need for decently tough online games, assuming you are a good, strong winning player. If you are crushing live poker, winning 20 big blinds or 25 big blinds per 100 hands, this is roughly 10 big blinds per hour, give or take if you're playing live, you need something like four or $5,000 to play one, two, no limit hold'em, which is not actually all that much. This is why I recommend a lot of players get good at live cash games, go put their butt in the chair and grind it up. Because if you can win roughly 10 big blinds per hour or $20 per hour, you're going to be able to accumulate and double your bankroll somewhat quickly, which will allow you to move up to 2.5, do the same thing there, move up relatively quickly, move up to 5.10, do the same thing there, move up relatively quickly, assuming you are a good, strong winning player and you're playing in games where you have a big edge. In tournaments, you need to consider a few things. First, what is your return on investment? We'll discuss that in a second. And also the number of players in the field, because as the number of players who are in the tournament increases, you're gonna take, take first, second, third, fourth, fifth place way less often. So assuming you have a 30% return on investment, which is a nice return on investment in live tournaments, if there are 45 players in the tournament, you need about 69 buy-ins in your bankroll. If there's 
245 people in the tournament, which is the case in most uh, local, call them prestigious events that happen once every week or once every month, you need 154 buy-ins. So if you're playing $100 buy-in tournaments, you need $15,000. Sounds like a lot, I know, but there's a lot of variance in tournaments, especially when your edge is not gigantic. If you're playing humongous events that have 2,600 players, you need 375 buy-ins. It's a lot. It's way more than almost anyone has for these games. And this is why a lot of people don't stick around. They end up going broke because they're sitting there playing with 50 buy-ins and that is a recipe for disaster. Again, this assumes you're a decently winning player as well. If you have a 10% return on investment, you need way more buy-ins. And of course, if you have a bigger return on investment, you need fewer buy-ins. To figure out your return on investment, you take your total profit divided by your total buy-ins. So for example, say you play 100 tournaments with an average buy-in of $115. Your total buy-ins would be $11,500, which is 115 times 100. And in those tournaments, let's say you cash for 15,000, giving you 3,500 profit. This is 15,000 minus 11,500. Your return on investment would then be 3,500 divided by 11,500, which is 30%. Recognize though, that your return on investment will fluctuate substantially from event to event based on the skill level of your opponents in relation to you, the structure of the tournament. If it's a turbo, your edge will go down and also the size of the field. Typically, as the size of the field increases, your return on investment will actually go up because as more and more players play the tournament, usually they're not the best players in the world because there's only so many best players in the world and that's going to typically result in your return on investment going up. But there will be plenty of times where a game of a particular buy-in may be way tougher than another game of the same buy-in. For example, in your local casino, a Tuesday night $200 tournament may be way tougher than a Saturday $200 tournament where all the people come to gamble on Saturday because they're not working. So always keep that in mind. A few more tips pertaining to bankroll. You can keep a smaller bankroll if you are going to consistently add funds to your bankroll because it's kind of like you have that money already, but it's not actually sitting there in the bankroll. Like say you have $3,000 now and you know you're going to put $500 per month to your poker bankroll for a year. Well, it's kind of like you have that extra $6,000 sitting in your bankroll already, which will allow you to play a little bit bigger. Also, if you're willing to move down quickly, if things go poorly, you can play bigger than your bankroll may recommend. And if you're willing to only play in very, very soft games, you can also play bigger than your bankroll recommends. This is how you see some players taking shots in overly soft cash games where they expect to have a gigantic edge because their edge is going to be much bigger than normal and it's a game that doesn't even happen all that often. So it's not like that's going to be your normal game. This is just a spot where you're going to take on a lot of risk in exchange for a very high hourly rate. The way you find soft games is you want to look for a party environment where everyone's having fun, gambling, splashing around, and they don't care about the money at all. Typically, this is going to be the case on nights and weekends. Also, if you can play tournaments when there's prestige on the lines, where they give a bracelet or a title of some sort, or just an event that everybody in your venue wants to win, that's going to attract players who are not actually skillful enough to have an edge in the tournament, and that's going to work out for you. And you want to look for tournaments that have lots of satellite qualifiers, typically because satellite qualifiers are used to playing a game with a very different structure than a regular tournament because they're trying to get in the top 10% of the field, whereas in a regular tournament, you need to get in the top 2% of the field to do really, really well. And they're used to playing for one-tenth of the stake of the main tournament. So typically, you want to be looking for tournaments that have lots of satellite qualifiers. You have to have a lot of discipline with your bankroll. A lot of people are not. A lot of people consistently playing games they are not bankrolled for, thinking their edge is bigger than it is. And if you do that, you're just gambling. And if you consistently gamble, you are very likely to lose. And I don't want you to lose. I want you to succeed. I have had plenty of upswings and plenty of downswings in my career, but I've always been very bankrolled to the point that the big downswings did not wipe me out. I've seen many other players who are better at poker than me be wiped out because they only kept 50 buy-ins, whereas I kept 300. And by keeping a much bigger bankroll, it allowed me to get through the inevitable swings of the game and come out on the other side and still be able to sit down and play and profit. And I want that for you. So remember, to succeed at poker, find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. If you do all those three things all the time, you will thrive.